Okay, so uh, my name is Dan Webb. I am the co-organizer of the Comoc Valley International Screenwriting Festival. And I'm here today with Giovanna Burke, uh, who is in North Vancouver. And she is a screenwriter and she submitted a script entitled Jane to our BC Shorts category. And she is the winner. Um, and it was a wonderful script. And, uh, and I'd like to introduce Giovanna Burke. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Giovanna Burke. I am a, a Canadian North Vancouver, West Vancouver native. Um, and I've been writing for the last probably eight years. Um, but I've been working in the film industry for the last 15. So yeah. Great. And so you've done some acting and you've done some producing and um, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, some some of your uh, past experience in those areas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I've been mostly acting for the last 15 years. Um, in 2013, I co-created a web series that um, ended up uh, being nominated for a Canadian Screen Award. Um, it won a bunch of awards on the uh, Canadian Awards circuit and some American awards. Um, it was a show about uh, three 1950s housewives with superpowers. So it was really fun to write um, and live in that time. And that's really what ignited my love for creating because I, all of a sudden I felt empowered to create stories that I really wanted to tell. So um, fast forward a little bit because I had two kids and of course things get a little crazy, but I wrote another show called The Trap that did the film festival circuit, um, which I acted in, produced and starred in and wrote, uh, co-wrote actually with another writer. And uh, since then I've been writing, um, I've got a couple of series that we're shopping right now. I've got a feature film, um, an MOW that I'm on the verge of hopefully selling and my short, which is what I would like to do is direct uh, this short as well and uh, kind of start that path. So that's kind of where I see myself going is writing and directing more and telling all those great stories that are floating around in my mind. <laughs> Wow, yeah, that's that's really amazing. Um, so yeah, you've got a lot on the go, obviously. Um, so in terms of this script, Jane, um, how did you come to uh, write it? Uh, what inspired you? Um, tell us a little bit about the uh, origin story. Absolutely. So during the pandemic, um, I was going nuts, you know, as we all were at first, we were all locked up. And um, I've been reading a ton trying to keep my brain afloat. And I came across, I was looking at um, stuff in the public domain and kind of trying to find something to inspire me. And I came across the story, The Yellow Wallpaper, which is a um, one of the first pieces of feminist uh, literature ever written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And it's this story about this woman who is confined to a room in the 19th century by her husband um, to deal with her nervous depression. And it's it's very literal story and it's about a writer. And it just really stuck to me like glue. Like I could not shake the story for some reason. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I started talking about it with everybody. And that happens a lot. Like I'll get inspired by something, but this one just like wouldn't go. And I think it was partially because I connected with it so much because we were all confined. And for me, writing was such a... Um, like a way out, you know, because I get into my imagination and I stop thinking about what's going on outside. And it was like my, my creative outlet. So if I didn't have that creative outlet and I was confined to a room without my computer, I would absolutely, you know, go insane. So I just connected with this character on so many levels. So I decided to take that uh, piece of public domain and create a short story that was still set in the 19th century against the backdrop of what Charlotte per Perkins Gilman had created, but I wanted to make it more of a first person confessional, um, give it more of like a modern twist in the dialogue, uh, make it feel more today um, and make it relatable to what we're all kind of going through. And I always like to bring in elements of, I was a professional dancer prior to my film career. So I always like to kind of um, meld in professional, like a dance into my films and, um, and in the wallpaper there, you know, she starts to stare at the wallpaper and sees all these things in the wallpaper. That's kind of where the story goes. And in my version, she sees a dancer. And so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, <laughs> yeah, that was a very evocative image. Um, the, 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 the sort of mirror dancing of the figure 
in the in the wall and uh, and and Jane herself. Yeah, I was very I I could I could imagine that uh, scene. Um, oh, awesome. On the big screen. Absolutely. Oh, that makes yeah. me so happy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, it was very, very, very good. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the, um, the, the idea that you're kind of modernizing the, uh, you know, the dialogue and, and I guess in a way the style of um, the way that the, the, the different characters interact. It, it felt kind of anachronistic, intentionally anachronistic in the sense of like, uh, I don't know, maybe an Armando Iannucci, you know, Death of Stalin or The Favorite or yes. um, or the, what's the TV show that uh, Tony McNamara um, wrote? Um, the Great, The Great. Oh, The Great, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, right. Yes. Um, yeah, and so I, I was wondering, uh, because you have some cursing and you have some kind of obviously very uh, contemporary turns of phrase and so on. Um, yes. Did you have any particular uh, style in mind? Any any movies or TV shows? Um, yeah. Um, when I was creating the the first person, I was thinking something more like along the lines of like Fleabag, you know, mm. um, Amelie, like kind of those kind of moments where she's having confessionals. And I mean, I can only imagine that people in the 19th century would still speak the way we do. You know, I mean, yes, we would speak more formally to our peers, but in our own heads you know, we're so informal with ourselves. So if we were to be so informal, like we would today, um, I just thought that would make such a cool, I don't know. I, I felt like we would connect with that more today's yeah. audiences. Oh yeah, I, I think absolutely. It's, especially for a short. Yeah. Um, because it, it, that's what, that's what brings in a little bit of the comic relief into your script as well. It makes it yeah. less, less oppressive, I would say. Totally. Right? Cause it's um, really depressing. So I had to make it funny. Exactly. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no. And, and, and you pulled that off well, that balance. Thank I mean, you. <laughs> it's very difficult to, uh, and, and I think shorts in general, as a rule, you want them to be a little uh, more, uh, um, Perky, a little more um, vibrant Move and, and less oppressively um, dour, and <laughs> yes, yeah, so, totally. So I think you did very well in that respect. Oh, thank you. Has your screenplay had any other success at other festivals, or have you? So, is there any interest in producing it? Or yeah, so you'll have, this is my very first. Um, I just wrote it during the pandemic, and so this was actually right. my first screenplay festival that I even submitted it to. So I'm like crazy humbled <laughs> that. I, I got the feedback that I did because I mean I've had a few producers read it and I actually have a producer attached um, we're hoping to make it um, in the summer so we're just trying to start to we're just doing the budgets and trying to get funding organized for it so that's really exciting um, oh, but yeah sure. I've had a few people read it and they really love it so yeah I don't know I feel very positive about this uh, particular show I feel like it's fun and different and we need more female stories right now so when you were writing it, tell us a little bit about your your process. Um, did you run into any challenges? How many times did you, you know, how many different drafts did you go through? Um, uh, and you could lead that into a question of like any tips of the trade that you might have. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, my process basically was because this was an adaptation, I guess, and it was my first time actually taking another person's work and trying to figure out how, what kind of story I was going to take. I took her story and I analyzed it and kind of broke it down into what I felt could be a three act structure for the story. Um, but then, and of course I wanted to add some twists. So with her story, she saw, she saw just a figure in the wallpaper. Um, she never really interacted, like she interacts with the figure, but in a very different way. So I was trying to figure out how to make that happen. So I started to just outline the story um, as well as I could. I knew that uh, I wanted the husband to be cheating on her. That doesn't happen in the, in her, in the other story. Um, I wanted to up the stakes and I wanted Jane to have a relationship with the figure, like a, almost a romantic, like a romantic relationship with the figure, because it's like, it was her expression of uh, everything she wanted to be outside of this trapped place, you know? And so, um, so I need to figure out how to make that romance happen as well in just like a little, a little moment. So um, yeah, I, at first, when I, the first draft that I wrote was pretty dry. It didn't have as much comedic relief in it. Um, it was not first person right away. It was just like a, 
regular script. I can't even think of the words right now, but not, not first person confessional the way I had it. So then when I read it, I was like, like you said, it was a little too oppressive. I needed to give it something else. So then I started to play with the idea of um, the comedy and how I could bring that in and the different voices of the characters. Um, so it was really easy for me to then switch it over. So Jane's voice originally was very proper the whole time. And then I switched it over to make her improper to herself. And then with the figure, there was a different voice there as well. And the figure is like a very metaphorical kind of, uh, has a metaphorical kind of speech. So I started to play with the speech. Um, so then when I got that and I got that really well organized, I went back through and tried to figure out, sorry, about that all the, um, like all the little moments that I could switch out, you know, like for example, you know, what kind of a tool would she use to kill him? And, um, you know, just stuff, all those little things like that. So then I started to add those back in and see how that worked. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's always for me, the process is always about layering and going back, rewriting, you know, figuring out what's working, what's not, and, and pulling it out. And the original draft I had was much longer too. And then I cut it back. So yeah, it's, t it took probably, uh, I'd say at least four drafts of the, the script before it got to a good place. And then I have a, pro my producer um, read it and gave me some notes as well. And then I fixed it up and now that's the script that you guys got to read, so. Oh, great. And um, so uh, did you ever have any moments of uh, writer's block where you just couldn't figure out how to move forward? Um, and do you have any tips on how to deal with things like writer's block? Do I have tips on how to deal with writer's block? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I always step away for a little bit because when I get too stuck into it, um, I can't think through the problem. So I'll go for a walk. I'll move my body. I'll do something to get away from my screen. And um, usually after a good night's sleep, like I'll usually take like a good 24 hours away, um, something will change. Like I'll just have like a glimpse of, of something that, that might work. And then, and then I'll just like pick up my computer and start typing. But I definitely always have to step away from the project for a while and do something with my body. Right. Otherwise yeah. I'll keep thinking about it and I'll stay stuck. Right, yeah, okay, good. Um, I think that's uh, good advice. In terms of the future, uh, in your, your screenwriting uh, potential career, what, uh, what are you hoping to do next? Af after this has been produced, of course. Yeah, well, I think my end goal is, I really like to show run um, on a series. Uh, so I've been working, like slowly working towards that goal by writing all the time. Um, so after this, I have a feature film that I'm, would like to direct. So I would like to take this short, produce it, um, get it on film festival circuits and see how it does. Um, and then try to start funding my, my feature film, um, which is just in its second draft right now. And then um, I have some MOWs that I'd like to try to sell as well. Um, what is an MOW? I actually don't an know. MOW is an, a movie of the week. So ah, in in Canada, we have a lot of uh, production companies that do MOWs, and they're it's a different, a completely different market than like an independent feature uh, market. But you know, I feel like if you can sell some of those and get you know get kind of a name for yourself as a screenwriter, maybe it's going to help you fund you know your dream projects that you want to make. So I figured, why not try to take that road? since I have been working in, in MOWs for years. So um, yeah, so I kind of know what the structure of an MOW is and it's very different than a regular feature. It's kind of a very, it's a very um, formulaic way of writing, but that's okay. You can find creativity within the formula always. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to, those are the two things I'd really like to do is the short and the feature. Those are my main things. And then um, hopefully, um kind of push into television a little bit so we'll see <laughs> great well i step think you've got step. a great pardon me step by step right it's all strategic we'll see what of happens of course <laughs> yeah yeah well i think you've got a great career ahead of you um you know uh, that's your first uh your first script uh you know you've you've 
you're headed for great things, I think. So oh, um, thank you. I'm, I'm very humbled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much, uh, Giovanna. It was really great talking to you. And uh, we are once again, really thrilled that you decided to uh, enter your script. And uh, uh, we can't wait to uh, talk to you more at the festival. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. And I'm so happy that I got to have you guys read my script. I'm very humbled. <laughs> And I'm back with another interview here. Uh, this is uh, Mike Adams is one of the jury members for the feature features jury. So we're going to have a little talk with him and um, see what kind of insights he can provide us regarding screenwriting. So thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, oh, excuse me. I should also mention that uh, Mike, of course, is going to be leading the uh, workshops, the four uh, screenwriting workshops. I am. So... Oh, I am. I am. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, did we forget to Thanks tell for you that? Thanks for that plug, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got the schedule, but you know, you never look at stuff, right? Yeah, I, I'm sure you can just do it off the cuff. You know, you've been doing it for a long time, right? Not, it's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, is this like one of those, uh, one of those um, fever dreams that uh, academics have when they realize they have a class to teach and uh, yeah, um, they it, haven't done any preparation? Yeah, exactly. I'm about I, to date myself, but that's what Altered States was all about. It was the panic that sets in before a classroom seminar. So. <laughs> Trust me, I've had a lot of those. I have a lot of those dreams. Yeah. Um, great. So um, welcome, Mike. Thanks for uh, participating. Oh, thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. And, and a happy Saturday morning. Indeed. <laughs> um, uh, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about, about your history and uh, your uh, professional uh, pursuits and so on? Uh, it shouldn't take long. I was born yesterday and uh -huh. uh, I'm as gullible as a fork. So that's good. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I have been in filmmaking in some form uh, and writing for uh, 26 years now. And um, uh, what happened was... Uh, I had a friend who asked me if I could write a, a screenplay for him. And this was about 26 years ago. And, and I had been writing, you know, really terrible poetry and bad short stories up until that time. And he seemed to like that. So I uh, thought I could write a screenplay. And I, I went to the only source I, I had at the time, which is called a library for you younger people. It's a great building to get to know later when the pandemic opens up. Uh, and took out the two screenplays they had there. One was Jacob's Ladder and the other was uh, Indiana Jones. Um, and so uh, I had good teachers and I learned how to, uh, as soon as I opened these, these screenplays up and read them, uh, the, the, uh, the formatting and the speed and the economy of language and the cinematic way it made me think just spoke to me and I absolutely fell in love with screenplays and discovering how to write them. And uh, so that was a long time ago. And the first thing I did is I recognized after I wrote my first screenplay that I was terrible at it. And um, I wanted to get better. So I thought the first thing I better do is learn the language of cinema. So uh, I went to work uh, at my other love, which is photography. And I, uh, I joined the, uh, the IATSE local for cinematographers and started working my way up. Uh, from a trainee to a second assistant camera uh, person to a first assistant camera person. I did that for about 16 years as I was learning how to write. And at that, you know, at that time, there weren't many sources uh, to help out new writers. Um, but there was one book called uh, The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler. And that seems to be the one that sort of started off this uh, desire to know more about screenwriting and the storytelling process, interest in people like Joseph Campbell, um, the hero with a thousand faces and all that kind of stuff, uh, Carl Jung and the archetype model, um, all these types of things, Aristotle, of course, poetics and, and coming through. Um, and, and all that stuff started to open up and we've got now today an incredible industry, not only of screenwriting, but we have an incredibly supportive industry of screenwriting education out there for people to get to, which is great because new writers now can just by taking a seminar on the weekend advance their writing more than I could after a year of, of 
trying to figure it out on my own back 20 years ago. So this is a fantastic time to be a writer. Um, okay, so uh, what else did I do? In, the, in that time, in the last 25 years, I've written uh, 34 feature length scripts. Um, 10 of them right now are in development with different countries. Uh, a couple have been made, I've been very lucky that way. Um, but where I make my bread and butter now living in Vancouver is consulting. So what I do is I help people get their scripts into good shape for shooting. So I'm working with directors that have been employed by small production companies to, to do local work or to do work. I have uh, clients in Europe and, and the US as well. And it's really talking through story, making sure the, all, all the elements are working, that, that each um, um, character in that story is authentic and real and true to the story and things like that, uh, making sure that everything is integral. And of course, the major, uh, major component of storytelling, story structure, the part that nobody really wants to deal with, um, but is critical to the success of any story. Um, that's what I'm into now. That's what's paying the bills. Um, lots of, I, I'm never going to stop writing myself, uh, even though I'm incredibly busy doing the other one. Um, uh, because I think like most people out here, most people who are at the festival, I just love writing. And uh, when you get called to do it, you got to do it. So uh, I'm a writer, I'm a consultant. Um, I also work with uh, companies that have nothing to do with the film industry, helping them create story, helping them with uh, marketing plans and things like that. And I've been doing a lot of that this year as people are emerging with new ideas to try and reinvent themselves. There are stories to be told in that, in that industry or, or in those industries. And, uh, and people can use our help as writers to help them tell those stories effectively and to connect with their, their future client base. So that's been an interesting tale as well. And I believe you have um, a history being a uh, professional screenwriting teacher as well. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been I've been teaching uh, uh, screenwriting seminars now for about ten years. Been teaching at uh, 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 film schools now for about five years. So I, I was over in Shanghai for a couple of years in China, teaching at the uh, Vancouver uh, Shanghai Vancouver Film School there, and that was an incredible opportunity, an incredible experience. Um, came back and did some some uh, work here with the Vancouver Film School, and then I've been teaching my own uh, set of seminars that have come out of uh, that body of work, um, particularly in China. And um, the, the challenge there is that there isn't a lot of formal story structure in China. Their, their literature is, is quite open. Um, uh, not open in terms of ideology, but open in terms of the way their stories are structured. So it's not a concise piece of work like we would hand off for a two hour film. It's, it's something quite different. And um, they were very interested as students to, to be able to learn that structure idea, to be able to compete out in the world market and bring some of their stories out into the world so people could start to figure out who they were. Um, and, and so the challenge was, okay, well, how do we communicate these ideas that you and I, Dan, have been inundated with just simply by being consumers of, of well-made stories from Canada, from the U.S., from Europe? Uh, we, have a, we have a real advantage to uh, over countries that are maybe a little bit uh, uh, closed off in, in what they're able to see and view. They don't get the intrinsic uh, osmosis of storytelling that we do. So how do we bring that to them? And, and a lot of the, uh, the work I'm doing now has come out of that. How do we communicate story structure in a way that's intuitive for people when they don't have a history, when they don't have a background with formal storytelling? How can we relate the idea of structuring a story in a way that makes sense just as a human being? And, and that's been transformative for me in my own work but it's also been transformative in, in the way that I'm connecting with people when we do these seminars. So um, uh, what's coming up next weekend is gonna be a lot of that. It's not gonna replace what people use as their, their go-to structure or anything like that, but it's gonna complement and add to the toolbox of everything they've got. So, so hopefully that's, that's gonna be a fun thing to go through. Um, 
when when it comes to uh, your experience being on the jury, yeah, and reading uh, the screenplays and um, evaluating them, do you, do you have any general insights uh, or suggestions for uh, future uh, submitters to the competition? Did you notice any trends? Any anything that uh, you might uh, you know, sort of a flag and say, here's, here's something we, we should, we should try to avoid or, yeah. and, and yeah. alternatively, um, was it, did you observe anything that uh, recurring that you were quite impressed with? Right. Um, yeah. I, I, I sort of just generally would be interested in what your experience was on the jury reading those, those screenplays. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, the scripts were incredibly varied in terms of where they came from, which was really, really cool. I mean, I think we had submissions from, from Europe. We had submissions from the U S from Canada. It was awesome. Um, uh, and some of those flavors really came through. Some of them stumped us though. We couldn't tell where they were from. Right. When we were looking at them, which is a good thing as well. We don't want to have a, a, a predisposed idea of what that story might be like due to region. Um, but in terms of, of an overall impression of, uh, of the scripts we were reading, the quality was very good. I was surprised by that. Um, almost across the board, if I had one thing that uh, I would tell people to key in on, and, and I think we're doing that all throughout the, the seminar with, or, or the uh, uh, festival with what we're talking about around tables and so on, is saying, listen, if you're serious about storytelling, you have to learn story structure. It's the hardest thing to learn um, when it comes to storytelling, and it does take time working with it to become good at it. But if people start working with story structure now, they're going to intuitively take that in and begin working with it without having to think about it so much down the road, down the road in their career years and years. And why is this important? Because festivals are fine. Um, we, we, we love them. It's a chance for us to connect. It's a chance for us to network. It's a chance for us to get our work out there and get some great feedback on it. But in the business, it's a, it's a slightly different approach. Festivals, I think, are nurturing new talent, growing it, um, bringing it out, having an open discussion without you know, a lot of competition involved. But when it's, when it's selling to the industry, if your story structure isn't bang on, it doesn't get across the threshold. It doesn't even make it through the door. And that's the number one thing they're looking at. Does your story work on a structural level? Do you, and, and everything follows from that. So if your structure works, your characters work. And more importantly to what's happening now in television, if you, if you take features, that's, that's one thing. And now you're applying a feature structure to each episode but with television where you have to sustain either a mini series length or you're going in years and years and years of season if your structure isn't just absolutely bang on there's no way you can build over years and you end up having you know we've seen it all the time great first seasons from certain shows and then they just tank because they don't know what to do they don't know how to structure. They don't know how to build purpose into what they're doing over time. And they don't know how to raise the stakes in, a, in an organic, elegant way. So long story short, story structure. Understand what it is. Study all the different forms that you can. There's a whole bunch of great books out there. And we'll talk about those in the seminars. Give you a book list to go to and get some education. Um, but don't be afraid of it. It's your friend. Almost every new writer I talk to, and certainly I went through this as a new writer, there's an aversion to structure because as soon as we say structure, we think formula. And we've all read those stories. We've all read those scripts where you can predict what's going to happen. You know, every five minutes, it's, 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 oh, it's terrible. But listen, we all go through that process. The, the idea is to learn it so that we take it in we understand structure intuitively, then we don't think about it. Now we're transcending structure and, and we're writing stories that people can't see the structure. It's there, but they can't see it. They're so wrapped up in the story and the characters that we've now transcended the technical part of our writing. So that's what we're after. 
Um, the other things we're noticing is that uh, uh, the creativity is, is, is amazing. People are coming up with just stunning ideas. Um, and and uh, the, the energy that comes from new writers tends to go into this idea making concept. And, and so what you get out of there is a real free space where maybe people would not uh, support that idea if they're down the road in the industry um, because it's like, oh, that doesn't fit this or that box or whatever. We're not interested in the box. We just wanna see you know, what your free mind is gonna create. That's what festivals are all about is having that opportunity. So there is a, a, a great variety of, of creative spaces being created in those scripts. And we wanna see that. So um, if you can surprise us with your ideas, surprise us with your characters, but still ground them in a sense that we can relate to them, wow, you've got something special. And we were seeing that across the board. So we love that. Um, quite often with new writers, what we see is mimicry. So. Uh, writers are uh, reading perhaps scripts that they really enjoyed watching and learning their style from reading those scripts or novelists that they like, literature that they like. They're aping those styles to try and find their own. That's fine. That's all a part of the process. And eventually you're going to come out of that learning. You're going to come out of that ingesting of scripts and literature and magazine articles and all that kind of stuff that you take in for inspiration. And, and instead of aping somebody else's style, your style is gonna evolve from that. And that's, you know, that's what we're trying to help people to get to, to allow them to go through that process, but to come out of it the other end with a unique, special voice. It's uh, a lot of festivals I see, they're calling for, you know, we want unique voices, we want this now. It's impossible to expect that from somebody who's only been writing a year or two years. It's, it's just not gonna happen. I mean, people need time to develop their craft. And um, uh, that's the other thing is that don't expect it all to happen at once. If you're coming to a festival and maybe you've only written one or two things, this is a chance to learn. Don't expect to sell here. If you come in intending to sell something, you're, you're, you're writing number one, I think for the wrong reasons for your own creativity. I mean, we all want to make a living at it, but if, if your attention when you sit down at the typer and try and get into a deep state and connect with your characters is to make a few bucks, that's not going to come, uh, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, people are going to see that right away. So um, allow yourself in the process, I think for new writers, if we're giving a, a, a third piece of advice here is allow yourself to go through that process and recognize it's gonna take time to move through these stages as a writer and to develop your skills and to develop your psyche as a writer. Incredibly important. So yeah, why don't we stop it there at, at sort of three ideas to work on. Great, well, and that's a great tease for the, uh, for the workshops, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to those. So I think I will just leave it at that unless you have anything else you'd like to add. Only uh, uh, just a thank you to the to the people who are coming to watch because um, this is uh, this is our first Comox Valley International Screenwriting Slash Film Festival, and uh, uh, the response I mean the response in terms of submissions has been amazing. So just thank you for everybody for pitching in and 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 offering their stories and ideas for us to take a look at. And uh, I, I just so much look forward to speaking with everybody next weekend. Uh, I've, I'm really, really impressed with the response we've had so far, and I look forward to it. I am Stephanie Rossell, one of the co-organizers of the festival, and I'm here with our features category winner, Jamie Campbell, who wrote the beautiful uh, feature script, Call Me Thor. Congratulations and welcome. Oh, thank you so much. What an honor. I'm really excited to be part of the festival and the fact that you guys uh, enjoyed my work really, I, I can't tell you how much it means to me. That's great. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, well, I'm in Kansas City right now. So the home of a uh, barbecue <laughs> is uh, kind of where I'm at in the middle of the country, but I've been kind of a nomad. Um, I was born in Oklahoma and then 
Uh, I have lived in Chicago. I was there for eight years and then Los Angeles and moved to Kansas City a few years ago. My primary background uh, is in stand-up comedy for the last decade. I've been a touring stand-up comedian. And when the pandemic hit, I was somebody who was interested in writing, but had only really done uh, things for the live performance space. Uh, so I'd written a one-man show. I'd written my own stand-up comedy, of course, and a lot of sketch comedy that was performed in Chicago and, and a few short plays. But I'd never tried to do something as long as a feature screenplay. And Call Me Thor uh, stems from a personal story, uh, but I wrote that during the pandemic. It's my first screenplay, so it's been kind of overwhelming uh, to you know have people embrace the story like they have. That's great, great. Um, and um, so, how did you how did you just get into screenwriting? Was it a natural progression from from comedy? Yeah, um, well, you know, when you're a stand-up comedian, people always say you need to write a pilot because somebody's going to ask you at some point. Uh, and they say that you need to write a pilot that has you in it. And then I wrote something that doesn't have a character that I would play <laughs> in it uh, here. Uh, so I took uh, a class on writing a pilot and started to learn about screenplay structure. And someone talked to me and they said, you know, you're a straight white male. Uh, this is an age uh, where people are doing a lot of diversity hiring as far as staffing goes. And so uh, if if you write a screenplay that's undeniable, you'll have a better shot of somebody being interested in it. So that veered my focus. And mm -hmm. so I took a couple of just kind of online screenwriting courses. And one that I took uh, is called Script Society. And it's just a great eight week course that if you do the work in eight weeks, you'll go from concept to a first draft. Wow. And so I wrote that last summer. I wrote the first draft of this in that, that class and got some great coverage. And I sent it out to some other people whose opinions I value. And then I took their, they have a rewriting course that is kind of at your own pace. And I aggressively spent another three or four months doing a rewrite where I went through every scene and talked about what I thought was strong, weak, or neutral about it and made those changes. And it was around the end of last year that I had this current draft and started submitting. I decided this year I want to take a leap. That's kind of, I have a word of the year uh, that kind of encompasses what I'm trying to do. And uh, so to me, taking that leap and just putting myself out there um, is what I wanted to do with this. And this story is based on something that actually happened to me. So it really does feel like I'm putting myself out there by sharing it. Well, good for you. It 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 really does come through as that. Um, uh, so you don't write full time though, right now? I write every day. I just don't oh, write great. professionally full time. I've been. I think this is my 300th consecutive day. I decided if I'm going to write, I'm going to be all in. And so I now make myself sit down at the computer and I write every day. I've written another uh, feature link uh, since then. And now I'm in the process of rewriting that and working on a third. That's a good tip for writers to write every day regardless. That's, the, uh, that's a great. Um, Even if I'm just sitting down for 15 minutes coming up with names of character, that counts to me, you know, but I've got to do something every day. That's one of my favorite things is coming up with names of characters. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so tell us a little bit about Call Me Thor. Sure. Call Me Thor is about a kid that he's 12 years old in 1991, which, which is what I was. I was 12 years old in 1991. And this main character, Julian, is based on me. And during that era, my mom was in the middle of a custody battle with my father. Um, and they had had a very tumultuous marriage. It did not end well. And she was also living with a, a boyfriend who was abusive towards her. She thought there was no way she was going to be able to afford a good enough lawyer to keep her kids. There was more than one kid in real life, uh, but she thought she was going to lose us. So she grabbed us and we did. We ran through a string of battered women's shelters to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we hid out from the police and private investigators for six months. That's what really happened. Now in Call Me Thor, there are some different things. I never met my heavy metal hero, like a guitar player that then helped me out. Uh, my mom wasn't pregnant in real life. I fictionalized that, but it, she had just had a baby. And when we went on the run, we were taking the babies, but I didn't want to convolute the plot with too many sibling issues. And so I kind of decided, I was like, what would be fun? Oh, what if my dad was, you know, involved in organized crime? Um, and then I combined a couple of different abusive relationships my mother had had to create the Alvin character. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's definitely a fictional story, but it is a story that is grounded in what I really went through as a kid. 
Amazing. Well, yeah, and you can really feel it. I, I think um, having a glimpse at, um, you know, uh, the shelters and the organizations that, that uh, you know, support families in dealing with domestic uh, violence is uh, remarkable. And it's a great glimpse for us to see into that. And it, it, it really resonates as real and, and, and uh, like a community. So I, I really enjoyed that. Absolutely. From the script. You know, the Thank thing you. that I, I was going to say where, when, you know, my next question is when did, the, uh, where did the idea come from? But we know now that it came from your own life. Um, and uh, that's the best place for writers to come from is rooted from their own experiences. So it really does come through. I think one of the things that most impressed me about Call Me Thor was the balance between this childhood wonder and this heavy subject of do domestic violence. And uh, you balance them so beautifully with that nostalgic of the 90s. And so picking the 90s, I know it comes from your, from your, your childhood, but to me, the 90s is almost as if it's a character in the story as well. And was that intentional to, to do that? Yeah, well, you know, I don't think I sat outside the script uh, and thought as a puppet master, how many moments of the 90s can I grab and put in there? But when I look at myself in that lens, like, this kid, the, the heavy metal music, the late 80s, early 90s, it's such an important thing to him. And like that moment when Julian runs and they're, they're leaving, we had that moment where we had to wait for my mom's boyfriend to be gone to work and we made an escape. And I remember grabbing the batteries from anywhere in the house for my Walkman and my tapes. So that era to me, the music was huge. That was my dream was to be uh, in a in a heavy metal band with my best friend. His real name was Tad in the movie, he's Ted. But um, when I look back, just those snapshots bring me right back to that moment in time. You know, just that like that beginning when the narrator talks about, you know, the price of gas, uh, you know, teenagers wanting to look like the cast of 90210, um, 80s hair metal being in that transitionary phase where grunge was starting to take over, like those moments, grab me. There are a lot of things that like had we had cell phones or the type of technology right. that we have now that would not have been able to, to have happened. Like we'd have been caught probably much sooner. Right. Of course. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I didn't even think about that, but you're absolutely right. And I just, I just love the nostalgic in it. It reminds me of things like Stand By Me or uh, Wonder Years. It has that kind of feel to it. Um, and I, I just, I absolutely love it. And the 90s was, was you're right, of really music. And your, the music in your script really resonates too. It's, it's, um, it again is also a character which helps to support, uh, you know, uh, Julian and his uh, quest to uh, have music in his life. Why Thor? <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll tell name? you what, yeah, that to me, uh, I'm glad that you asked that because um, it, originally, my mom gave me the assignment when we were on a Greyhound bus on the way to New Mexico to choose what our new name was going to be when we were hiding out. And initially, I was a, a big like pro wrestling and heavy metal fan as a kid. And the name that I picked for us was Williams. And I did justify that Williams, oh, sorry, my doorbell's ringing. I will not be getting it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I justified the last name. Williams was a common name. Uh, and so it would be harder for us to find. Pretty smart kid, I gotta, you know, say. Uh, but the real reason I wanted our last name to be Williams was because I wanted my new full name to be Rock Ace Williams. <laughs> Rock after Rocky Balboa, my favorite movie character. Ace after Ace Fraley of Kiss. Uh, and then Williams so that my initials would be raw. Mm -hmm. I just thought that would be really cool. <laughs> In my young mind, I was like, oh, if my initials were raw, that'd be real tough, really awesome. Uh, and so in this, I didn't want to get that specific. I, I felt like that kind of would have convoluted it. You'd have a, a scene with a lot of dialogue and you'd have been like, oh, we could have gotten to the point in a half a page instead of five pages. And so I just uh, came up with that idea of like, oh, rock and roll names usually have one regular name that's relatable and then one kind of tough name like Joan Jett um, or Sid Vicious. And I was like, oh yeah, so Thor Williams. And Thor specifically, I, I just kind of went through a bunch of like tough idea names or comic book character names and just Thor just kind of seemed, just felt right. And I came up with the, the name Thor 
in the first draft, and that it was originally just the, the film was titled uh, How They Run. And then in the second draft, I was like, oh, no, call me Thor. That's that's a much better title. And that fits the whole thing. It does. And Thor, it just it sounds like something that a heavy metal, you know, singer would have yeah. as their name, Thor. <laughs> I think I might have stolen a little bit from Adventures in Babysitting, if you remember that movie from the yeah. 80s, because yeah. you had the little girl that had the Thor helmet and the hammer. That's right. And some of that still kind of resonates with me from that era. That's great. <laughs> and so, and you, you kind of answered it already. How long did it take you to write it? About so, you, your first draft you did in about a month, and then three months of a rewrite. Yeah, uh, about uh, three to four months of a rewrite, and then uh, one month of pre-writing uh, and outlining and character development, and then one month of actually just going through and and taking that outline and turning it into a script. Um, but I initially started talking about my own story in a one-man show that I debuted at a Fringe Festival in 2016. I wrote it out as a blog post. I'd never shared what happened to me, you know, and it was 25 years after the fact mm -hmm. that I, I wrote this blog post and almost deleted it. I was ashamed and embarrassed. It was really vulnerable. Uh, but before I got the chance to delete it, people were messaging me and being supportive. And I got a better response on that than I had in any comedy that I'd ever done. Wow. So I took that idea and uh, put it into a one-man show, and it was named the Best of Fringe at the Kansas City Fringe Festival. And so I did a national tour with it, and then the next year I did another national tour of just specifically Fringe Festivals. And then when the pandemic hit, I realized I had this well wealth of information and this great story, but I didn't feel like my specific story was quite right for the screenplay. Uh, so I dove in and decided to kind of alter it and make it a fictionalized account that was based on those events. And so what was the hardest part to write and what was the easiest part to write for you? Oh, wow. Um, I think the hardest part to write was the scene uh, uh, where, uh, cause I know I cried while I wrote it. The, the scene where Julian, uh, his mother, Linda, tells him that she's pregnant and they're stuck in the shelter and they're on the playground. And the initial version of that was a much lighter reaction. And then I tried to heavy it up uh, where he really rails against her, but then also realizes as mad as he is at her, he loves her more than anything else in the world. And he doesn't want to hurt her. And he knows she didn't mean to hurt him, but he's got to say something. Um, and so that was a hard one. And even when I go back through and read it, I kind of have to like, take a step away usually and take a break right after. I think the easiest um, part, and it's maybe, it's one of my favorite parts of the, the screenplay is the confrontation between Jerry and Julian towards the end of the movie mm -hmm. when he comes back in and they're in the green room and this kid almost flips the script and becomes the wise mafioso guy and gets the best of his dad and he makes a deal with him. He doesn't get what he wants because what he wants is to stay with his mom but he gets the next best thing and making sure that his mom is safe and that his new sister is safe. Uh, and he sacrifices himself in order to make sure that can happen mm -hmm. and agrees to go with his dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, he, he uh, suddenly has the power position. <laughs> yeah. And I felt almost like I was an improviser there and it was just the dad and the kid. And I just got to bounce back and forth mentally between each of those characters. And it, it just kind of flowed out of me. And I don't think I had to make, many changes in the, the rewrite phase because uh, it just kind of came out uh, in a way that I really liked. Isn't that great when that happens? <laughs> it's special. Yeah, you wish you could bottle it. <laughs> yeah, you know. bottle and sell it <laughs> would be nice. For sure. Uh, do you have any tips or advice for any emerging screenwriters? I think the hardest thing about being a writer, I think, is, um, is dealing with the rejection and the self-doubt because it's just you. And anytime somebody says, no, thank you, it's hard not to take it personal because you're putting your heart and your soul into something. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Uh, and for me, I would say, just remember that the people that are reading the work that you did are just human beings too. And when you think of like, I don't know, for me, I don't know, a lot of people I think have had this experience where you, you try to watch a TV show that everybody's really into and it's supposed to be great. And you turn it on and you just can't get into it. You're like, yeah, I'm just not that into this. And then maybe a couple of years go by and you go back and you, you turn it on. And you're like, how did I not like this? This is amazing. And it's because where you were in that moment in your life, that moment in time, 
you weren't ready to be receptive to whatever that was. And remembering that the person that's reading, they may just be in a point, whatever happened to them that day, where their mindset is that they're, you know, not happening to be receptive to whatever it is that you wrote. Don't beat yourself up. Don't throw everything in the garbage and think that you can't do it. And also trust the process that like, you know, you, there's not a death sentence for writing something that sucks. Mm -hmm. So you survive it. And then mm -hmm. you get to learn from it and get better each time. Mm -hmm. So allow that to be part of your process and, and don't quit. As a human being, what you're writing is something that other human beings are going to relate to. Even if it's not the ones that you're wanting to at the moment, somebody's going to relate to it. Uh, so you owe it to yourself to, you know, keep going, learn from whatever that experience is and keep, keep writing. So on that, on your process, is there anything, you know, I find that when, when I'm writing, um, I'll write stuff and, and maybe it's not quite right, you know, and I'm just not quite sure and I'll move on to a different part. But usually if I go for a walk, usually a long walk, my mind just starts working and I, I can work through a problem. Uh, and I know now, I know now, and then I rush to get back to, to rewrite what I've done. Do you, what's your process? Do you, you know, I know that Paul Thomas Anderson um, has a big whiteboard and he puts um, circles around things and connects them all. And do you have a, a particular process that, that helps you to overcome maybe a block or to, to move through a scene and, and um, get a new idea? Yeah. Well, if I'm usually, if I've got, you know, something outlined, like usually I don't sit down to write the script unless I have a plan mm -hmm. for what the script is. Cause I found that I get stuck or I go off on a tangent or I write a scene that I'm like, I really love this scene, but it has no place <laughs> in the script. There's just no room for it. Like what a fun conversation that we don't need. Um, <laughs> so for me, outlining is huge. And when I have the outline, I go in and I go, I'm writing this scene today. If I'm totally blocked and I'm like, I don't have great conversation. I don't have any of that stuff. I can sit down and I can write, the guy walks over here. He pulls out a gun, says, give me all your money. The teller screams, but gives him the money. You know, like that's not a, a scene that is exciting, but I can go back and fix it later. I'm, I just have to get the basic information out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be great. I can always fix it. That's what I love, I think. Maybe it's because I've done stand-up comedy so much that like if I have a bad set, I don't get to go back and fix that set. There's no rewrites for that live performance that I did. It is over, uh, but it's also gone. And I don't have access to it anymore. With a script, let it suck, that's okay. Then walk away from it. You're allowed to go back and change it. And, and knowing that you can do that until it's, you know, where you feel like it's ready, to me is such a gift that mm -hmm. your work just gets to be a living piece until you decide it's done. That's actually really great advice. I think that your experience with, um, you know, your live shows and your comedy has allowed you to accept <laughs> yeah. and move on easier than I think a lot of people uh, have the opportunity yeah. to do. So that's great. I guess it's just it's realizing that pain, everybody has pain and your pain is not the end of the world. So uh, just move on, get some perspective about it. Uh, sometimes it's easier said than done. What do you hope to do with your writing moving forward? Wow. You know, this, I, I hope to be able to just to continue writing and I will. Um, to me, I decided to go into this with no expectations when I decided to start my journey as a writer. And it's become something that I've fallen in love with. It's part of my daily routine now, my daily habit. And I think if nobody ever, you know, wanted to produce anything that I, that I wrote, I think I would still do it. I could be wrong, <laughs> but uh, but I, I'm enjoying the process right now and trying to see where it takes me. And I just want to allow myself to put my, my writing out there and be open to whatever may happen. I have been somebody that has written so much for the stage. And, and for many years, I just wrote things that were intended to be either performed by me or by me and a group of others. Mm -hmm. And there's something freeing about going, I wrote this, now I'm sending it off and I can control nothing. And I love that. So for me, I think I want to be a writer that just lets other people, who, people who are great directors, people who are great actors, lets them handle their job and do what they do well. And, um, you know, then I, you know, go on to the next thing and then get to go see what they did with it. Well, I thank you for your time. I, I have no other further questions unless you have something that you want to say. No, I just want to say thank you. It, it's really, it's such an honor, I, you know, uh, that, that you enjoy my script after 
all of the experiences that you've had. I, I'm brand new and very humble uh, to be here amongst uh, so many people who have been working in this field. And so if there's any advice that you have for me or if, if you can uh, you know, point me in any other directions, I'm very new here and very green and I'm just excited to be uh, a part of this festival. Today I'm here uh, for an interview with Darlene Tate, who was uh, on our shorts uh, jury uh, for, the, for, the, for the scripts that were submitted. So I'm going to talk to her today a little bit about um, who she is, um, what she does for a living, and her experience uh, working uh, on the jury. So uh, Darlene, welcome. Thanks, Dan. I'm thrilled to be here. Great. So uh, I guess we'll just start off. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your what you do for a living, and uh, maybe how you got involved with this festival? Well, um, what I do for a living, I, technically I am retired. Um, and that leaves me all kinds of time to get into trouble with various film projects. Um, so I really dedicate my, my um, self full time to the film industry in some capacity or another. I serve as president of our local independent film society. I'm vice president of the, um, the film commission and here in Victoria and recently stepped down um, uh, after completion of terms on women in film. So I'm fairly active kind of on the organizational side of things. Um, my heart belongs to acting. That's where I really um, try to spend the bulk of my time auditioning and, and uh, being on set, things of that nature. Uh, let me see. Um, so that, that's kind of how I have connected myself in this world to people like yourself and Stephanie. I have produced several short films. And um, so I've, I've connected around that. That's how I got to know you and Stephanie. And that's how I kind of came to be involved with this festival. Great, and uh, you're, you're part of uh, Cinevic. And I, I understand that currently there is a, a festival uh, that Cinevic is putting on. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? I'd love to. This is Cinevic's uh, ninth annual film festival. It's called Short Circuit. Uh, well, technically it's called uh, the Pacific Rim Short Circuit Film Festival. And what it does is it draws submissions from around the Pacific Rim area. So we have, uh, well, submissions from all over the Pacific Rim region. And uh, it's going for the entire month and some of the films are absolutely outstanding and they've been organized into various collections uh, including um, shorts from right here on the island so people who are interested in taking a look at the offerings you can see a whole collection of films for ten dollars or um, get a, a pass to see all of them and you've got a month to see them in um, for 45 dollars and if people just go to cinevic.ca Right there on the landing or on the home page, they'll find links to be able to uh, purchase tickets or to kind of get a sense of what kind of films are being offered in that festival. Fantastic! Yeah, I'm uh, after after I finish this series of interviews today, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, watching a couple of those. Um, I got my early bird pass, and so I'm excited to see what uh, yeah. uh, what's been submitted, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing films from all around the world. Yeah. Um, Great. So let's talk a little bit about your experience on the jury for uh, the Screenwriting Festival. Uh, you were on the shorts, which means uh, you were uh, evaluating for three different categories. Mm -hmm. um, tell me how you, uh, what your experience was like. Uh, what, do you have any observations about the scripts you read? Um, tell me a little bit about how, how you evaluated the scripts. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what elements were the most important to you when it came to uh, adjudicating them? Well, it's, um, first off, when I was first introduced to it and sent my first batch of uh, screenplays to review, I, I was blown away. I don't know what my expectations really were, but I started reading the first few and it was like, huh, I mean, these are really, really strong submissions. And in terms of reviewing them, you know, I think each one of the jury members brings their own experiences in. So from my perspective, 
one of the first things I'm looking at is the producibility of these, like how, if this short were made, how could it be made um, in, in terms of uh, the, the production elements to it? Um, and how might it fare on a festival circuit? And that really ties into storylines. Every festival uh, around the world kind of has its leanings in terms of what kind of stories it's looking for. So I'm, I'm looking, I was looking at these through overall readability. And um, as I had said to Stephanie, I said, I, I don't read screenplays, I watch films. So I didn't read these. In, in the probably a traditional sense of bringing that discipline of the screenwriting craft to every element of it. In my mind, I was watching every one of them and I was um, engaged in how these stories played out and how they would be received by audiences. So even though I scored them according to the parameters laid out by the festival, all of that was tinged with my own experiences as a, both a producer and an actor. Um, so again, going back to the beginning, I was blown away. There were some very unique storylines, um, many of which dealt with uh, very strong current themes and many of which were, um, I know if produced would do exceptionally well on a festival circuit, you know, like award-winning caliber screenplay. So my hope after reading all of these and, um, you know, the, I, I can't remember how many were in that shorts package altogether, but, you know, the top probably 10 to 15 of those, I'm just hoping that they find themselves a producer and, and get their shorts made because I, I thought they were quite outstanding. Was there any, anything lacking in a lot of the screenplays that you read that you think would have been really valuable to, to have or for the writers to focus on more closely in order to do better in the festival? Well, it's, it's kind of difficult to say um, because a screenwriting festival in, in my mind should be just that, it should be the craft of screenwriting. And to me, that means it, it, almost ignoring production possibilities, like don't let your story be in any way tempered by production possibilities. If it's about the screenwriting and about the story, then that's really all it should be about. Um, and so from that perspective, um, yeah, it's just about tell it, make, tell your story as uh, you know, authentically and richly, and, and don't bring, don't lock yourself into the production uh, realities of it at this stage, because at this stage it's really about your craft of screenwriting. Um, and, and later, if it if it turns into uh, a piece that will be produced, then there's going to be some conversations around locations and characters and things like that that may have to be adapted into something that becomes a producible piece. Um, the only other thing I really want to add to that is a very good friend of mine, an award-winning screenwriter, uh, Connor Gaston, uh, who's here in Victoria, once passed on to me a tidbit that has just stayed with me, and, 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 and I look for it in almost every um, screenplay I read now, and that is, he said, um, a screenplay lives and dies by its ending. And, you know, it took me a while to, for that to, you know, kind of to fully understand that. And, um, and now it's something I'm looking for in everything I review is the ending and uh, how, how satisfying or interesting or intriguing was that ending because uh, he's right that whatever it ends with is what your audience largely will be left with. And so that has become a critical piece to me when I'm looking at screenplays. Yeah, I think that's a really good insight. Uh, you know, when I've been reading a lot of the scripts as well, you can have these really strong um, starts to the script 
um, really intriguing characters, but then it kind of fizzles out near the end. It's yeah, it's 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 a really it's a recurring problem for sure in a lot of uh, scripts, including the ones I've tried to write. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I know exactly uh, what you're what you're saying there. Um, great. Well, I I think that's all we really need to discuss today. So thanks so much for your time and thanks for being involved in the festival. Um, I uh, I really look forward to. Uh, seeing you there and hope that uh, you can uh, participate in some way. Well, thank you for having me and thank you, thank you for uh, having me be one of the jurors. Like I said, I was completely blown away by the uh, caliber of submissions and it, it was kind of heartbreaking almost to have to choose the top ones because there are there were so many fabulous contenders and so many that I can see. So for the screenwriters out there, uh, even if you didn't make the top three or five, um, then you know, don't uh, don't lose heart. Um, I'm sure we loved it anyway, and I just hope to see them on the big screen one of these days. Great, thanks so much, Darlene, and good luck on your festival. Thanks, Dan. See you there. <laughs> so, welcome, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you for including me and uh, for this opportunity to talk about writing. Great. Uh, so. Um, let's just talk about you a little bit. Uh, give us a very brief biographical background and uh, how you came to be, be a screenwriter. My pathway to screenwriting involved being interested in films from a relatively young age. Uh, I say relatively young because I was initially, as a child, more interested in math and science, which might come through in the, in the winning screenplay a little bit but started to be more interested in, in film and things like that as a teenager and then went to film school after college. Uh, my college didn't really offer filmmaking, undergrad didn't offer filmmaking, but I went to graduate school for filmmaking and have continued on uh, writing and I was mostly a documentary filmmaker in film school. So screenwriting, as, as we know it, uh, in this festival, in this competition, um, doesn't really apply in documentary filmmaking, though documentary has a certain scripting process as well. Uh, so screenwriting, in this sense, fictional stories, has been something I've turned to relatively recently um, in any serious manner. Okay, great. Great. And, and what do you do for for a living, are you working in the industry or? I'm not working in the industry. Uh, I do teach. So I teach writing classes. I teach ethics. I teach a variety of classes and writing is one of them. This is a, this is a story about two young, um, two young kids. I think uh, they're 12 years old uh, and they uh, um, are very good uh, students when it comes to more like the, the STEM side of things, as you mentioned earlier in the interview, um, but uh, they've, they've uh, gotten some uh, bad grades in, in creative writing and their parents have high expectations for them and really want them to uh, sort of correct those grades. And so they sort of come up with a creative way to do that. So um, how did you uh, come up with this script? This script, is unique in the scripts that I've written insofar as it does have an autobiographical element to it. Most of what I write doesn't involve things I've been through or things that I'm going through. I don't, uh, I don't find it interesting to put those things on the page. But this one began with a childhood experience much like the beginnings of uh, what happens in this screenplay. So, uh, not in the sense that I had bad grades in a class or, or parents like this, but I did win an essay contest when I was this 12 years old uh, for people that wanted to be doctors in the future. I also won an essay contest a few years before that when I was in elementary school about people, um, why you're grateful for police officers. So when I was young, I just wrote all these essays. I don't know how common that, is. I think as I get older, maybe it seems like it's not as common as it seemed when I was that age. But nevertheless, I wrote this and believe it or not, the prize was to go to one of these 
labs where bodies are being studied at a, at a medical university and a medical school and and explore. So it seems like a radical thing for preteens to do. And when I look back on it, it is really strange. And, and it does come with all these horrific associations of hearts and brains and, and all these things. But that is where this particular script came from. Oh, wow. So, so you actually have memories of sticking your hand in, hands in cadavers and touching hearts and brains and so on and so forth? Yes, and much like much like what happens in the screenplay. Obviously, the screenplay takes place within the horror genre, and it departs from reality in a certain way. But those those uh, tactile moments of touching these different things at the different stations, those are true to the experience. I've modernized the setting a little bit so that it's contemporary, but. Um, also, similarly, the parents who accompanied as chaperones were far more shaken than the kids were, in my experience. And so I've written a little bit of that aspect into the screenplay as well. That, that, that when we were 12 years old, it didn't, for some reason, we all were fascinated by it. And, and yet the adults did not get accustomed to it as easily as, easily as the kids did. Right. There's a certain innocence to being young when you haven't learned to be uh, revolted by certain things. Yeah, like although I will say I write a lot of scripts involving young people, and I like exploring that idea of, on one hand, that innocence that you just mentioned, but also in, in another script that we may talk about, Ashley Knows, that script is about people overestimating the innocence of of kids or overestimating, you know, that kids have this certain ignorance about, about the world. So I think I like exploring both sides of that, that moment in childhood where you're becoming aware of adult things and, and how you process those or becoming aware of death and, and how you process that, et cetera. So the idea is that uh, I, um, these, these two children have been told, one, one's been told that uh, their writing is too rational, the other, it's too emotional. And then the teacher gives them this assignment saying, why don't you write a story together? And uh, maybe you can like bring mind and uh, you know, emotion together and produce something that will be, be better, uh, a better rounded story. And it occurred to me that perhaps what they were doing was they were taking a kind of uh, a metaphorical suggestion, which is, you know, you need more mind and you need more heart. Uh, which are proxies for reason and for emotion. And in, in a way, what they ended up doing in the story was they created, they, they made it literal, right? It turned into a literal uh, thing. Was that supposed to be kind of a funny commentary that they were taking everything literally, but with a little wink? Or was it supposed to be what maybe a script like this you would expect, where um, th they kind of are challenged and bring together actual emotion and actual reason to overcome an obstacle, which is what he wanted to see in their story. <laughs> That's a very good, I appreciate your reading of that. Um, you know, I can tell that you've thought about it and I, I appreciate that. For me, the literalization, well, I should start by saying that if, if we spoil the story, I guess the, the way of spoiling it would be to reveal that much of what we're reading in this screenplay is a fiction that these two kids have come up with together. The point at which it becomes fiction is a little hard to discern when you're reading it. I think you could have a different view of when we actually start to see the, the fiction within the story emerge. But by the end, it's clear that, that their, their very real field trip to this cadaver lab has become the substance of their story that they're writing. But as a writer, I like to start with, with small goals for characters. I find that if you have what looks from the outside like a small goal, it can often be something that means a lot to the person. So even though it's a small thing, it can have a large meaning or take up a lot of their energy and their thought life. So for these two kids who are very literal in the way that they see the world, their small goal is they want to raise their grade from a C and a B respectively. And they feel that pressure because of their parents. 
And so they, they try to do the next thing, which is approach the teacher and ask the question. So when he tells them what their weak points are as writers in creative writing, he understands from a writing teacher's perspective that we're always trying to balance intellect and emotion. So I wanted to comment first on that idea that that's how a writing teacher would approach the world. But my reading of the two, yeah, the two children is that they're not reflecting at all as they're writing this fiction on like sticking it to him in any way yeah. or being humorous in any way. I think it illustrates their characters to see how literally they take it. To me, that's what I was going for, that they're not, they're not being reflexive about it. They are, if the, the, the literalization of the head and the heart embodies who they are as, and, and it, it also illustrates why they're a good pair, why they work well together. Right, okay, great. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. It was, uh, it, it was really well done how you structured that. Re like in many respects, very simply, yeah, I've structure, structure and what the words like, what the words look like on the page are two things that I think about quite a lot. So in this particular script, and to a lesser extent, the, the other one that I submitted, the, they could both be understood as two act scripts. So exactly in the middle of both of these scripts, there's a turning point that determines the entire rest of the trajectory of the plot. And I know we talk as writers a lot about, as screenwriters, a lot about a three-act structure or in TV writing, the four-act structure, the five-act structure, et cetera. But I wanted to see with these shorts what I could accomplish in a two-act structure. So I did think quite a lot about that. Are there any particular um, challenges you've experienced as a screenwriter, whether it is in respect to your scripts that you submitted for the festival or just in general? What, what's the hardest part of writing for you? I would say that the hardest part of writing changes from one season of life to another. Recently, the hardest part of writing has been trying to find the time to do it because of other commitments I've had. And I think making time to write as simple an idea as that sounds to do, um, is not is not often easy to do is uh, is particularly making time to write when the inspiration is also there so for me that's part of it perhaps relating some to the idea of having small goals or low stakes that become larger over time for me i i don't depend on writing for writing is generally a very low stakes thing in my life and in some ways that makes me freer to explore script ideas that I might not necessarily explore if I were, if I had to be commercially minded or if I had to earn my living from it. I think in a way that's one distinction in the pressures that I face from the pressures that working screenwriters would face. Yeah, I think that's probably true. It also occurred to me that I know in my own writing one of the challenges has, has been to overcome academic writing, um, you know, for, you know, for literally, uh, I guess it was 14 years of my life, <laughs> I did my undergrad and grad school and I learned to write um, essays in a certain way. And then I know that uh, I, my first few attempts at um, doing screenplays, uh, my, uh, my wife and uh, other people would tell me after reading them that, like this is this sounds way too academic. People don't really speak this way, um, and uh, it's something that I've had to become very conscious about. Have you experienced the same thing? Or for me, I think it might the two worlds might be slightly closer together simply because the scholarly writing that I have done and that I do is mostly involved with popular culture and the arts anyway. And so even though it's even though the venues for that writing are sometimes scholarly journals or books that I write for the substance of what I'm writing. So I, for instance, I write a lot about contemporary television. And so in the past couple of years, I've had several chapters in edited volumes about different television shows, Twin Peaks, Haunting of Hill House, 
I just had one published about Black Mirror. So even though it's a different type of writing, it's analyzing the same world of story that screenwriting involves. So I think I'm able to bridge the two worlds a little bit more closely. Right. Right, good. But but you're correct that the formatting is completely different. And mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and in a screenplay, you're writing several characters' perspectives rather than writing from one dry, you know, perspective that includes your argument or or explanation or analysis. So so there are very significant differences between the two types. I mean, I know you said the greatest challenge is that when you uh is finding the time to write. Um, and I know that you say, because you don't rely on writing uh, screenplays for your living, you, you have a lot more freedom. Um, and, and maybe writing block won't be quite as big a factor. Um, but how do, how do you deal with that? Do you ever get to a point where you're, you've been working on something and you've been really passionate about it and engaged, and then all of a sudden you just can't think of what to write next? I do have those moments of writer's block. And a couple of the solutions I've found that are valuable are to keep a list of any idea that strikes me, no matter how small an idea it is. And if I keep that list, and I try to also date the list so that I can associate it with what I was going through during that period, uh, I just keep a running list. And if I reach writers, a moment of writer's block with a current project, I often find that I can go to that list and find another another idea that I had at some point and just wrote down and I will be inspired for one of those ideas and maybe I'll just start that other one and make very little progress on it but something about shifting my attention when I have the time to another screenplay which is the same activity it helps unlock something that benefits me for the current one as well and I think there's an analog there with when you study film editing and different parts of the filmmaking process, there's a school of thought that says, you have to step away from the work if you're too close to it. And so that, and some people say that before beginning post-production on a film, you know, filmmakers should jump out of an airplane, you know, do something really, really radical to shake up their sense of priorities and perspective. And, and then when they revisit the footage, they're going to have a different perspective on the content. It's not going to mean the exact same thing it meant when they were very close to it before. I think screenwriting is very similar. Step away from it for a moment, channel that in, uh, energy into something else, and then return to it. The other thing is, I think it might have been Robert McKee, it was one of the famous story gurus that said that the three sources of story material are memory, imagination, and fact. Memory being something that comes from your own life and experience. Imagination coming from something you haven't experienced but could conceive of. And then fact, something that did happen, whether it happened to you or someone else. And I really do find that those are all encompassing, that if I'm having trouble with one area, if I'm having trouble with a certain story or coming up with an idea, I can just shift over from memory to imagination or from imagination to fact. And that will usually unlock where I need to go next. Wow, that's a, that's a really great insight. Um, probably a good place to... Uh actually wrap this up. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for the interview. And uh, I really look forward to, uh, you know, discussing this more at the festival on the 7th to 9th. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed this discussion. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce Robin Weiner. Hello. Nice to be here. Here. Great. Zooming. <laughs> Uh, Robin, wh where where are you located? I live in Vancouver. Okay, great. So tell us a little bit about yourself as a, uh, in terms of uh, your profession and your history and how you came to be uh, associated with uh, the sc Screenwriting Festival. Uh, well, I'm, I've been in the film industry for about 25 years uh, and came out here originally from Winnipeg, but I'm a independent um, film producer, but I also make my uh, 
my my daily bread being a production manager and line producer. I've done a number of uh, MOWs and uh, working currently on a, a feature film, a thriller called Heat Wave. And yeah, so I've been in the industry for quite a long time. I was a member of Women in Film. I sat on the board for about four years. I was president for a couple. I also used to teach part time at the Vancouver Film School doing budgeting and scheduling. And, you know, I've sat on a number of, uh, of juries and uh, including like short films as well as uh, the Leo Awards, although this year I had to uh, respectfully decline just due to a, a very, very busy work schedule. So, but yeah, that's kind of my, my background in a nutshell. Great. So um, let's just talk a little bit about your experience being on the jury for, for our festival. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the types, the elements that you were looking for when you were adjudicating these scripts, um, was there any that you focused on in particular coming from the specific uh, professional background that you have? Well, I think, I think shorts are particularly hard to write you know I think people think features are hard but I think actually shorts are um, they're an art unto themselves because they are exactly that they're short um, and you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of room to tell a story so where a feature you have you know 100 120 pages 90 minutes 60 minutes if it's a short feature you have so little time with a with a short film and a short story to be able to tell a really good beginning, middle, and end, and really make all of those elements very tight. I I think that's really hard to do, and so that I find particularly interesting that people can take whatever shell of an idea they have and turn it into a story that's watchable, readable within anywhere from sort of five to, you know, 20 minutes in length, you know, is there typically the, you know, the short film time. So I think that's a very hard thing to do. Okay, great. And so, yes, yeah, so I was reading, when I was reading them, I was looking for, you know, what was grabbing my attention. Uh, and, you know, I'm kind of interested, I'm interested, people always say, what do you like to read? And I just like to read good stories. So uh, I don't always like horror, but if it's a well-told horror, then I'll read horror. If it's an interesting art house piece. Uh, so I try not to be limited by genre, but really story. So as I was reading them, you know, you're kind of, as you're getting to halfway through the script, you're sort of wondering if it's hitting the beats of where that story might conceivably go when you're hitting page 10 of 15 and how how a writer is going to wrap that up and also I mean basic things like looking for the structure of the script uh, and and spelling right people don't really think that it matters but it actually kind of pulls you out when something is ill spelled or you know is improperly spelled you, it just kind of pulls you out for a moment and uh, so yeah those are kind of the basics and character you know how it roast I am and the character and I'm a very visual person so as I'm reading the scripts you know where my mind is going and how I'm conceiving of the script so I might have a different perspective than somebody else reading them you know because I'm kind of looking at them a little bit more from a how would I produce this how would this look you know type of thing. Having been on uh, several juries now um, would, would there be any uh, sort of final piece of advice you would give of screenwriters uh, who are thinking about submitting to either our competition or other festivals in the future? Um, I would say just do it. <laughs> you know, you have nothing to lose. There's absolutely nothing. And I would probably say if anyone has a story that they're interested in, again, I still say write what you know or write what what is interesting to you. Um, if you are writing about what you don't know, then I would say do a lot of research on that. Um, so you're not writing your version of what you think somebody living with cancer might be going through. If you've experienced that, there's 
so much to be said about having a personal connection story. And I think those are usually the best lenses. So if you don't know what it is, then uh, research or trying to talk to experts about what that might be. Uh, and then I would say, if you have, if you've finished your script, give it to people who are not your friends and your family and have completely nonpartisan input. It will be hard to hear, but I think it was, um, I want to say it was, Kat, um, there was a writer I saw a number of years ago at VIF and she spoke about her script and she said the first time she sent it off to random readers in Hollywood, she cried for like three days. Mm. And, but it made her script better because she wasn't getting a glossed over opinion from people who, and not to discount people's parents or best friends or, or boyfriends or husbands or whatever you're gonna have people read. They're always, no one's gonna tell you the harsh reality of what, what your story's about. And also you're getting a perspective from people who may not be as, um, as versed to be able to give you in input uh, on on what that is. So I would say send it to people who do not know you and have them respond and listen to that feedback and 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 get that from completely random people. But I don't mean random like someone off the street. I mean send it to a couple professional writers, especially with a, with a feature um, and have a story editor read it. And really take those comments to heart. It's hard because so much of what people's writing is, is their own heart and soul. And they've put, you know, any to anything from months to years into developing something. But I think not listening to that feedback is dangerous. I read a script, I think it was last year. Um, and it was terrible. And it was a pretty much a copy story from something else. It was also a white guy writing about a black person's uh, journey based on a true story. And it was the wrong person to write that story. And his only pull in wanting to do this is that he had met somebody on a cruise ship and, and, and thought, wow, this would be great and it would be commercial. And I think those are all the wrong reasons to, to really write something. Not that you can't write commercial scripts, but if you're writing it because you think you're going to make a lot of money, you're writing it for the wrong reason. So, uh, you know, as, and I think if you are going to write things that are somewhat controversial in nature, try and get a lens because you will be criticized. You know, as a white person, I'm not going to write about um, a journey of like uh, an immigrant coming to Canada. I have no experience on that the comments uh, about um, trying to get feedback from people you don't know that are connected to the industry somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so, some festivals, of course, have uh, the option to submit and get feedback. Um, it usually costs a lot more, of course, to submit to those. I know I've done it once, at least with uh, one of my scripts. And uh, yeah, the feedback was invaluable. Um, yeah. Even though, uh, even though it was like you know four times as much as mo as a regular uh, submission, because of course um, you have to pay someone to do the uh, do the advice or the reading and the the comments. So, but yeah, absolutely a good uh, good. Well, and I'm somebody when I read a script, I I'm not like I'm not somebody who reads a script and will tell somebody that the arc on page five was in the right place or that they hit the mark here. I don't have, that's not my skill set, but I will read it from a story perspective. So whenever I, I give comments on scripts and I'm usually, I think my comments are usually pretty good. People seem to like the feedback I give at least, but my, my comments are really more about character, story, um, and a general feeling of where I felt things went in the script, how it moved me, and less about the technical elements but when you get story editors who read that that feedback is super invaluable so i'd almost have like kind of two people not that a story editor can't give you all those other points but you're going to get somebody like a producer like me who will read it from a story perspective 
and characters and theme and tone. And then you'll get somebody like a story editor who will give you all of the technical um, information and, and some obviously, but that feedback is really helpful too, because when you watch a really good polished script, it does hit all of those elements. You just don't realize it as you're watching a final product. But that is, you know, sometimes you watch um, a, you watch a story and you think, well, that ending came up really abruptly. And it's probably just not that balanced when that happens, or was that the intention for that to happen, right? So, yeah. Great. Well, I, I don't really have any other questions. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we end the interview? Um, yeah, I can say I, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Stephanie and Dan for putting this festival on. I actually think it's, uh, it's awesome that they're, where we're, there's a place where people can tell their stories, especially this past year, which was probably great for people that are sitting at home and, and you know, wanting to be creative and not being able to work or not being able to make films, um, maybe this year the way they could, especially shorts, they're a little bit harder with all of the COVID protocols. So I think it's great that there was an opportunity. And I was really, really impressed with the scripts that I read. I thought there was some really, really interesting and new ideas, or even if they were a retelling of the same thing as, you know, the Save the Cat book will tell you, there's really only so many stories, but they're told differently. And so I, I really thought that some stories just had a really cool and, and fresh take and something. And so that I really enjoyed. And I was also very, um, I was inspired by the writers that I was reading and I thought, wow, this is, there are some great stories and themes that are, that are coming out. And I hope regardless of whether people won or didn't win, the fact that you sat down, you write a, you wrote a script, it was entered into this uh, competition. I think everybody's kind of a winner in that regard and that they should keep writing and not give up because they don't get into a festival or they don't get into something I think it was the movie Ford versus Ferrari. I think they said it took 10 years to get that movie made, right? Mm. From concept to screen. So, and that's a big budget film with stars and, and it's a great story, but 10 years, right? And if you look at the history of some of the best films out there, they really have a long road ahead. So, you know, nothing, nothing comes easy. So I would just encourage every writer to just, keep writing because there were definitely a few scripts that I kind of went, well, I would it'd be interested to see where this person goes in their career or, you know, could they do a feature? So, yeah. So thanks for putting this on. It was really, I was happy to be a part of this, uh, um, of the festival and happy to be part of the jury for sure. Great. Well, thanks again, Robin. And uh, hopefully you can, uh, participate uh, at some of the events in the at the festival thank you yes send me the links and hopefully i can do that i'm here today with sean clark who is the winner of the uh, micro shorts the vancouver island micro shorts category with his script uh, perfect appetite um he also uh, uh won in uh, uh excuse me he also placed in uh, uh two other categories um, in the features uh, film category, he came in third with the Gunslinger, and he also came in was it was it second I believe right in the right second in the uh, in the international shorts uh, for Beyond the Veil, and then he also came in second in the micro shorts category with the Picker Green. So today we're going to focus uh, on the Perfect Appetite, but for now let me just uh, welcome Sean Clark. Hello. <laughs> Uh, all the way from Nanaimo, mm. by the way. Sorry, I meant to say uh, all the way from Nanaimo. For those of you that don't know, that's uh, just about an hour and a half or so south of the Comox Valley on Vancouver Island, the second biggest city. Um, great. So, Sean, uh, congratulations on your success. It's incredible that you uh, uh, submitted four uh, scripts and they all uh, placed in uh, various categories. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your yourself? What do you do for a living or what have you done in the past and how did you get into screenwriting? 
Uh, well, I'm 48 years old. I uh, was born and raised in the Vancouver area. I'm new to Nanaimo. I moved here last year just before COVID hit. Uh, and uh, as far as a living goes, I, I, I currently work as, a, uh, as an actor, but uh, a little bit out of work due to uh, COVID as well. Uh, as a, and uh, so whenever people ask me what I do for a living, I said, I'm a screenwriter and, a, uh, and an actor. And uh, I'm more interested in being a screenwriter than an actor these days. Uh, I fell into screenwriting by accident. Uh, it was about three years ago. I uh, was uh, asked to uh, like partake in uh, making our own material for a bunch of actors that weren't getting any work. We had a film crew and we needed a script and nobody was stepping up to write the script. So I knew I was good with words. I'd never tried writing a script before. So I wrote my very first one. It was actually three years ago, like almost to the day, like, uh, this month, three years ago in April, that I wrote that script. It's called The Fart, and uh, it's about four guys playing poker and uh, tossing around hot topics from the internet, like, uh, you know, world peace and whatnot, and uh, it's uh, it turned out really good. Everybody was complimenting me and saying, man, you should try writing other scripts, and uh, I'd been sitting on a, uh, a an idea of mine, my first screenplay, full, first full feature that I wrote, I started it a few months later, and uh, I uh, tried it. Like I tried it out. It was a zombie, a zombie comedy uh, called Tainted Meat. And uh, as soon as I started writing that script, I just fell in love with the process. I I was like I had ideas of where I wanted the script to go before I started, but uh, the thing took on a life of its own. I became addicted to finding out what was going to happen next in the story, and. Uh, Having uh, grown up, I have ADD, and I, I've always started different projects and never finished them when the work got hard, and screenwriting was actually something I could hyper-focus on, and uh, I, I got really excited that finally I had something, a talent that, uh, that was hidden uh, that I didn't know, and uh, I... Uh, uh, wrote uh, took me three months to write my first screenplay and then uh, the next screenplay I started immediately as I typed the end on Tainted Meat I started my next one and that one only took me 16 days to write a full feature uh, and I didn't even know what I was going to write about before I started writing it so uh, it's uh, been a journey uh, doing that and uh, uh, it's uh, three years now that I've been writing and uh, I love it I can't see myself not not doing it I have hundreds of other stories that fly around in my head every day. I just have to take the time to sit down and type them out, find out where they go. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your winning script in the Vancouver Island microscript category. So the, uh, the perfect app is, excuse me, is it the perfect appetite or perfect, perfect appetite? appetite? Yeah. Perfect appetite. Right. Great. Um, why don't you give us a little uh, synopsis of it and just tell us how, how you uh, thought of the idea, where it came from, um, and uh, the process of writing it. Okay, well, I specifically uh, chose this uh, script to write for the, this contest. So uh, I had one other micro script and I wasn't sure, the, the one that came in second, the Pickard Green, I, I thought it was a bit juvenile. <laughs> it was a fun script, but uh, I wanted to showcase uh, my more serious writing talent uh, with this. So uh, it was an idea. I'm a, I'm a really good cook and half, half the time I don't know what I'm in the mood for to eat. And uh, I had always wished that there was an app on your phone that would, uh, you know, like tell you what you're hungry for. And uh, like, so the perfect app for the perfect appetite. And uh, so like uh, I put a man on a bench and he made him so he was uh, down and uh, like the, uh, upset. And then another person is a bit of a nosy uh, a busybody type that wants to fix everybody's problems enters the enters the situation. Uh, I didn't really know uh, where I was going. I just knew I was going to showcase the the app that uh, gives you the perfect uh, food to eat. And uh, I put the guy on the park bench, and I had the stranger come in, and uh, their personalities developed as I was writing it. It's really uh, that's really interesting. Um... It seems like across uh, all your scripts, um, you 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 have really interesting, um, maybe almost I don't know if they'd be anti-heroes, but you have kind of characters that are a little bit quirky, a little bit rough around the edges. Is there any? Is there something that attracts you to those sorts of characters? Um, something uh, something that 
compels you to write them like that? Uh, is it is it related maybe to some kind of uh, you know TV shows or movies that you tend to like more than others? Uh, yeah, I, I I do like antiheroes. Uh, like uh, like my favorite Marvel character is Deadpool. I love twisted endings, like where like uh, you're going in one direction and then you have the wool pulled out from under you, uh, kind of thing. Um, I. I believe all my scripts have that will be pulled out a little bit. Like, well, the gunslinger, not so much. That's more of a traditional good guy, bad guy uh, uh, type of uh, uh, type of screenplay. So, uh, but uh, I had never thought about what you what you're saying that these characters have similar. I've never really felt, thought about it. Uh, like I just, uh, my favorite writer for novels is Stephen King, uh, and. Uh, he, I, I always wondered how he had that many people walking around in his head. And as I, be, as I started writing, I was like going, these people aren't walking around my head. I create them as I need them. And I take traits from other people and stuff like that and place them in there. Half the time when I just come up with a name of a person and as I start writing it, then they're, uh, how would they interact with the uh, main protagonists or other characters? It d dictates who they are. And as they start to reveal themselves to me, I give them, you know, different quirks and stuff like that. So uh, it's, uh, uh, my mind goes so fast. Like, uh, it's just like uh, having ADD, it's a gift uh, for that. Cause uh, like, I, I'm thinking it up as I'm typing it. So it's, uh, it, I, I'll have to go back and look at my characters again to see if there's a pattern or uh, coming about. Did you, did you at any time along the way, I know you say that you write very quickly uh, did you run into any challenges when it came to writing that particular script? Um, no, actually, that one there, okay, was only, I think it's only about, what, four or five pages long? Uh, I, that, that, that screenplay, I had the idea, like, the, the, I was, knew I was going to write about the, the perfect appetite, the app. I didn't know which characters and how they were going to turn out. I believe I wrote that in probably 15 to 25 minutes. Like, and uh, of course, I mean, that's just the initial beginning, start, beginning, end. And, uh, and then I, I, as through the editing process, I, I add personality quirks and stuff like that, to change a line here or there. Uh, but uh, I believe the whole process for that, uh, from the, like the idea to finished edited product was probably about two hours. So I didn't, I didn't hit any bumps in the road. I didn't know, like, it just, I just went with the flow. Yeah. I, uh, and I, I do respond well to writing challenges. So like somebody say, uh, there is a, uh, uh, there's an evil book on the, uh, on the coffee table. Uh, and then I, I will come up with a story around an evil book on the coffee table and just figure it out from there. And, uh, uh, invent characters and uh, have fun have fun with it you know if I what that's one thing about my writing that I love is that if I never find any success or professional success with getting paid as a writer I'm being paid as a uh, as a human because it brings me such joy to, cre to create and uh, express myself in a creative way okay well thanks a lot for uh, your time today Sean and uh, I really look forward to discussing your script writing in at the festival this this coming weekend so um thanks again and we'll see you soon all right excellent looking forward to it hi i'm stephanie rossell and i am co-organizer of the comox valley international screenwriting festival and i'm here with one of our jury members leah flag leah was on the shorts jury welcome leah thank you happy to be here why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, I hate talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, what, what can I tell you about me? Uh, my day job, of course, is in the film industry. And when I'm not at work, I am developing um, local filmmakers, uh, crew, cast, and writers. That's great. And right now you're working uh, on production in production, is that correct? Uh, actually, I'm just wrapping up a show called American Dreamer. So a uh, feature film, I'm hoping to have a few weeks off to enjoy some summer with the family. Maybe not get as sunburned as I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and then we'll see what's coming our way to the island. Um, so what is your relationship to screenwriting? Oh, goodness. Uh, I come from more of a publishing background, um, starting way back in my past life. Um, 
and I've sort of migrated through music festivals, publishing, hospitality, special events, theater, and now film and TV. Um, one of my favorite things to do is work with creative writers. So in publishing, I did a bit of that. Um, and that's really transferred over well to the work that I do um, in the independent film filmmaking community. So um, working with new writers from UVic and, and actually writers, you know, my own age that have started and decided it's not too late to live the dream. So, it's never yeah. too late to live the dream. Never too late. <laughs> <laughs> have you written any of your own screenplays? Uh, yeah, I did a short film um, just because I wanted to do a project from top to bottom. Um, and see what it's really like to do all those different pieces so I can work uh, really well with, with people in my day job that do those things. It gives me a better understanding of what they do and the responsibilities they carry, um, you know, as far as uh, working together as a collaborative team and as a storyteller. So, yeah. Do, um, do you expect like a screenwriter on set with you? Like on the show that you just wrapped, are, no, are no. I mean, we did very often what I found um, in the projects that I've worked on is that screenwriters are very often producers as well. Mm -hmm. So that was the case on this show was our, the one that wrote the, <clears throat> excuse me, the one that wrote the screenplay was also one of our producers. So um, he would zoom in, um, do like we would do a digital stream so he could see some of what was happening during the day and, uh, you know, consult on dialogue and that kind of thing. So, yeah, so that was a really interesting experience. So what are the most important components of a screenplay for you? Oh, um, I really love character driven screenplays. Uh, I love to see deeply psychologically developed characters. That's, I write that way um, because it's also what I really love as a reader is to really get into that mind and that experience of, of the people in the story. Um, and to me, that's a lot about what story is about, is, is how we evolve and change from our experiences um, and how we interact with other people in our, our communities as we evolve. Mm. When you were reading the submissions, what mm. elements did you focus on? What were you looking for? Um, because it's a short, I didn't focus as much as I typically do on how much momentum was in the story to carry me forward because that's something that seems to happen quite naturally with shorts. They really need to go um, kind of hard and fast. <laughs> so it was really, um, if I could really engage with the character emotionally, if, if I really found their perspective interesting, not necessarily that I hadn't seen or experienced the story before, but they just had a unique voice. And so that's what would really draw me into the character and, and uh, intrigued me and, and kept me reading. Great. And uh, what advice would you give any up and coming or emerging screenwriter? Um, I would say from a writer's perspective, don't worry about perfect technique just get the story out there, um, just spill it out onto the page and then you can polish it up from there. And then it's more natural. It doesn't feel contrived. And if you need to give it more momentum or scale back a little bit, um, then you can do that afterwards. And what about as uh, a jury member, someone who's, uh, who's judging the, the work? Um, I would say that that is when format, you really need to focus on format because one of the things I struggle with uh, because I write and because I've gone through, I used to tutor writers and things like that. I will get pulled out of the story if there are too many errors in formatting or grammar, unless it's meant to be grammatically incorrect. You know, if they're, um, for whatever reason, if the characters maybe English is their second language or something, then yes. But typically speaking, if it's grammatically incorrect or it's spelled incorrectly, or I'm jumping from dialogue to a scene description and there's not really any heading changes it's very confusing and hard to follow the story and, and then you lose me and it's it's hard work to get me back in <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean and it's hard to visualize isn't it it's yeah, hard to visualize absolutely. the story if it's jumpy like that it's jumpy in your mind as well if you're trying to to yeah. see what the what it's all about yeah absolutely. um I don't have any other questions for you unless there's anything <laughs> you'd like to say, anything uh, that you want to say to any of the, um, the winners or, or 
Um, I would like to say that uh, as a writer, congrats, because it takes a lot of courage to put your babies out there in the world and, and get feedback on it. It's not always an easy thing to do. So um, yeah, kudos to the writers. Excellent for taking the risk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I hope that you can partake in our festival. I know that you're mm -hmm. awfully busy, but if you can, May 7th to 9th, we'd love to have you there. All right. I'm sure I will pop in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being on our jury. We really yeah. appreciated it. My pleasure. Viewing a, uh, a jury member for the features jury, Frank Marr. Did I pronounce that right? I should have asked you beforehand. <laughs> Moher. Moher, excuse me. Or Moher. It's Frank or more. Uh, it's a matter of controversy in the family, but we are named after the Cliffs of Moher in Ireland. So go with that. I was uh, at those cliffs uh, yeah. two years ago. Yeah, Good. my wife and I did a, a cycling trip through uh, that part of Ireland. You amazing, amazing place. Pardon me? You owe me rent. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> and and to make it worse, I, I come from English stock. So um, that's okay. We lend them out. <laughs> Great. So, uh, Frank, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your relationship to screenwriting, to um, uh, any creative uh, endeavors you take part in um, and uh, your relationship to the festival so far. Right. So I've worked as a writer since I was about oh, 20 years old. Um, and uh, back in the day, uh, I, uh, I began in theater. Um, eventually, I also wrote screenplays. I wrote screenplays for you know, about 10, 15 years professionally, worked in TV too. Uh, and then eventually um, I came to work in theater and journalism. So probably for the last 25 years, I've worked primarily in theater and journalism while also teaching both subjects at Vancouver Island University. Great, and so for those that don't know, Vancouver Island University is a university in Nanaimo, which is the second biggest city on Vancouver Island, I believe. Right, so VIU has campuses, the main ones on the, in Nanaimo, yes, but there's also ones in Duncan and uh, Parksville up uh, toward Courtney. Uh, but yes, uh, university with about, I guess, about 18,000 students, I think, at this point. Great. Okay, so, um, uh, and how did you get involved in the, in the festival? Well, Stephanie, your colleague, was a student of mine uh, not too long back at VIU in the script writing program. So I teach in creative writing and journalism uh, at VIU. I do for about, oh, uh, two and a half months more, and then I'm uh, taken off after 30 years. But I've taught uh, script writing and journalism in that department for since about 1991. Uh, and Stephanie uh, was one of my students. And so when you guys started to organize this festival, she asked me if I would come on as a judge. And I said, Stephanie, you know, I haven't written screenplays for quite a while now. Um, but she uh, said, well, you know, story is story. So I took her word for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you, so do you have any um, notice, noticeable success stories uh, when it comes to uh, students producing uh, screenplays? Well, we've had lots of students go on to, now I don't know necessarily if they've had their screenplays written uh, or produced rather, they've, they've certainly written lots. What I encourage them to do is to make them themselves. Uh, we also have students writing say, um, audio drama and uh, webisodics and stage plays, right? So in any of my classes, most of them at least, there's people working on all different kinds of uh, scripts. And certainly um, a lot of them have gone off and produced themselves. Uh, and these days, I sort of think that's the more likely way to go. Like there was that guy who wrote, what was the movie, Hannah, right? He, uh, he came from Nanaimo, went to the Vancouver Film School, uh, which is where I think he wrote the early draft of Hannah. And uh, then somehow that got picked up and rewritten and became a big movie and now it's a big TV series. But, uh, a lot of the time, the best route for people is to, uh, say, write something that um, is on a scale where, if need be, they can go out and do it themselves. So that's what I recommend, um, would be writers of any kind, plays, screenplays, webisodics, audio drama, 
these days, you know, as I say to students, you know, you, you're, you're sort of the first generation who has the option of being a creator as much as you are a consumer of entertainment. Uh, so take advantage of that. Don't just be a consumer, go out and make it yourself. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, I, I, that's something that uh, we've been doing a lot of here in the in the Comox Valley. Actually, we have this kind of tight little community where we've just been making each other's movies for a while uh, with no budget. And <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, the the old myth was, well, I'm going to go someplace and make it big, and that was usually New York or L.A. or maybe in Canada, Toronto, and you know that's great. Um, people have all sorts of good reasons to leave, say, the small town they're in and go off and try something else. But as an alternative, these days at least, you know, if you find where you are not that interesting, you dream of the big city, well, your option is just make where you are more interesting. Do something to add to the community you're in, including, for example, setting up film co-ops, right? So I, a student of mine, who, another fellow who was a student in one of my classes a long time ago, Zachary Tanner, uh, he stood up in my first year class and said, hey, let's all get together and make movies. That's essentially what he said. Well, Zachary went off and created uh, Hub City Cinema Society, which is now called Cine Central Forum, which has become a really active and influential hub for filmmakers on central Vancouver Island. So that's the other way to go. If you don't think something you want is present where you live, go make it. Then maybe you don't have to go off and make it big someplace else. Yeah, precisely. Zach's um, organization of uh, of Cine Central now is, has been a real um, uh, inspiration, I would say, uh, for Absolutely. for a bunch of us here in the in the valley. Yeah, great. Um, so, w when when you uh, when you think about uh, screenplays, uh, what do you think are the most important elements for you? When uh, you, I mean, ultimately, I want to ask when you're adjudicating them, but maybe you can speak in the abstract a little bit about the most important uh, components of a screenplay? So I think it's telling the story visually to the greatest extent possible through image and action. I remember being in my 20s and coming out of theater and uh, just getting into writing film and TV and somebody saying to me, well, you know, you have to tell the story through uh, action and images, right? And I went, no, you don't. I'll just have great dialogue. Uh, but I've learned better. <laughs> so I think that's it. Um, leading with action and image, dialogue kind of bringing up the rear. Now this is screenwriting, say TV and webisodics. <clears throat> They're in many ways quite close to theater. They are a sort of meeting of theater and screen into a new thing, where which is often dialogue driven, right? Um, but screen in particular, I think is visually driven. And then um, characters, of course. Uh, I, I think usually a clear central character helps, makes your life easier as a writer at any rate. Obviously there's multi-protagonist films and whatnot, but unless you're consciously trying to write one of those, um, a, a good strong central character helps. And then structure. Uh, I, I believe structure is your friend also. You don't necessarily have to uh, go with any particular structure. You don't have to do the Sid Field three act structure. You don't have to do the Saving the Cat seven act structure. But some structure, um, I think, again, will make your life easier and probably result in a more enjoyable experience for the audience, which at the very least has been uh, trained, we have been trained to expect a beginning, middle and end. And often that's all structure is. Great. Um, when you uh, were reading the, uh, the screenplays for On the Jury, uh, W was there anything you would uh, identify as a recurring problem or would you have any suggestions for future submitters when it comes to things that they should really pay attention to if they want their screenplays to be successful in a competition specifically? Yeah, so I was impressed by the fact that actually most of the people had the sort of basics down, you know, how to format a script, you know, what is a scene, um, things like that, how to do a slug line, uh, real basic stuff, but it's, you know, it's the kind of stuff I teach in first and second year classes at a university, so you have to learn it. And I think, I think as festival coordinators, you did a bit of filtering that way, but by the time the scripts reached us, they were looking pretty good. But I, I certainly think, you know, it's, it's important to, look, 
um, all kinds of script writing are collaborative. You're uh, not just, you know, it's not poetry you're writing to put in a drawer. Uh, you're creating a document that other artists and technicians and crafts people can work with to make something collaboratively. So part of your job as a script writer is to turn out a good working document. Um, now, you know, maybe you don't have to worry about that up front, but at some point you do. And I, I think that's important just to understand that we're not just doing this for ourselves. We're doing it, yeah, for an audience, but we're also doing it for hopefully the dozens, if not hundreds of people who will end up collaborating with us on the film. So um, it, it's not a question of just doing it to be neat. It's a question of doing it to honor your fellow artists. Have you noticed any changes over time when it comes to the types of movies that are being made and the types of scripts that are, um, you know, the basis of those movies? Uh, and uh, do you do you imagine? Do you see any trends? Do you see any trends moving forward? Any any advice for potential screenwriters in respect to where you see screenwriting going uh, from here? Right. So that's a great question because screenwriting style, in particular, constantly evolves. I mean, if you go back and look at some old shooting scripts from the 1940s, they're full of camera directions. They're full of all sorts of stuff that you won't see in a screenplay these days. So I think the main thing is that screenplays have tended to become simpler and focus down on character, story, dialogue, and leave the how to shoot it, how to act it, all that stuff is, you know, is going to be somebody else's call. So what, what a writer has to do is be able to write a script in a way that, you know, it will be more or less what they intend when it's produced. But the first thing script writers of any kind have to understand is it's never going to look and sound like it did in your head. If you're lucky, it'll be better, but it won't be the same. So you, there are ways to sort of build into your script um, the, the, the basic story, the basic characterizations and all that stuff, uh, but uh, expect the unexpected. And so, you know, I think over time, screenwriters have come to learn that and they provide the bones of a movie and, um, and their collaborators fill in the rest. So I think that's been the main change over time is just uh, screenplays have become simpler. Great. Well, is there anything else you'd like to, to add? No, uh, it's great to see so many people out there, not only making films, you know, I've also judged short film uh, contests and whatnot. And boy, there's a lot of short films being made in the world, aren't there? Film Freeway, I think, has more than 4,000 short film festivals using it. But it's great to see a contest like yours, which focuses down on the writing of them and encourages that, and in particular encourages it to, you know, to happen wherever you are. I think that's the real key to it. Uh, do it where you are and be prepared if necessary and go out and make it yourself. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Frank. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope you're able to participate in the, the festival coming up May 7th to 9th. And um, uh, we'll just leave it there. I'll do so virtually for sure. Excellent. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Experiences on the jury and her relationship to screenwriting. So welcome, Patty. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you came to be involved with, uh, uh, with our festival. Sure. Uh, I am, I guess, a, I consider myself a storyteller is usually what I say. Uh, because I am a filmmaker, I work in the service industry of the film industry as a script supervisor. Uh, I also have been an editor in the um, local community for 10 years. I used to co-own a editing company where we did a lot of uh, independent Canadian films. Along with that, I used to do a lot of editing. Uh, now I just edit for my own projects. Uh, I write, I have written screenplays and uh, most recently because I, I don't know, I just am finding that I don't want to write in that um, medium at the moment. I've been working on a young adult novel. So it's, I, I look at myself as a, as a polymath. I pretty much, everything that's creative, I feel 
um, supports its each other aspect. So it's not like, I think the thing that is the most difficult is people try and pigeonhole you. And I've just never allowed that. <laughs> Maybe it's, um, it's inhibited my trajectory in some ways, but I think knowing all these things, being creative is uh, you get to do anything you want because they all, they all support each other somehow. Um, and that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> and good luck to anybody else who tries that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your novel about? My novel, well... Great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your experience on the jury. Um, uh, first, tell, tell us how you actually got involved in uh, the festival. Um, and uh, then tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, just some observations you had as you were reading the, the, the scripts. Um, did you... Uh, uh, was there was there anything in particular that struck you as you read them in terms of the quality or the themes or the um, uh, you know the whole process of of, of bringing them in? Uh, did you uh, did you feel anything particular? Were you surprised by anything, et cetera, et cetera? Sure, uh, I was brought on to the the jury, I guess the into the this particular jury because I'm a script supervisor uh, and one of the creators is also of this um, competition is also a script supervisor. Um, and I think because we're both um, writers and, and creators and filmmakers, uh, I think we've just always known that besides being a script supervisor, um, which is a hell of a job on its own, um, <laughs> uh, highly underappreciated, I have to say. Um, but that, uh, you know, I, I had a maybe a more broad perspective that I could offer to this, um, this process. I have a tendency to like films and that are, and stories that are different, less contemporary, less um, on the nose. I like magic realism. So I actually find that I'm a good person to be on a jury because I offer a, a different perspective. Different perspectives and points of view seem to be elements that you really focused on. Was there any other elements of screenwriting that you found yourself uh, kind of really valuing when it came to adjudicating these scripts? Yeah, um, I was looking at it, let's say if I was looking at it from a script supervisor's standpoint, in terms of, not in terms of always continuity, but continuity of story, um, I would look at, you know, are things tracking? Are we missing? You know, if you bring something up, is it is it paid off somewhere else? Um, that kind of that kind of story tracking in terms of continuity. Uh, in terms of script writing, you know, I I know that a part of it was that it should be in industry standard, how it's structured. And I think that's not a hard thing to do, um, especially since the internet will give you many opportunities to look up what that standard is. <laughs> so I think that helps. It's kind of like, you know, you don't show up in, in your pajamas if you're meant to show up semi-formal, it's like, there's kind of a, a format. And so I think one of the big things is looking at industry standard, although that wasn't you know, something that I would deduct because I'm looking at the story, but uh, it is easier to read if it's 
properly formatted. Um, I looked in terms of um, as a filmmaker, I looked at if it was doable, is it shootable? Uh, who, who would shoot it? You know, if it was like way too expensive, but uh, look, you know, too many locations, blah, blah, blah. Not that that should inhibit a writer, but I'm just saying, is the story unique enough that it warrants these kind of um, expenses to go somewhere to shoot it? Uh, if the story is is not unique enough, um, could be well written. It's just you know been been told, and you don't have a different um, spin on it. Then that's inhibiting for producers as well as filmmakers. Like you just can't get funding. But um, you know that the in first drafts or whatever people bring those and then they get crafted. It's like, oh, well, we're, we have to shoot this in, you know, uh, Iceland. <laughs> so to get the money we need. So then you adapt it, but it's like, you know, it really is about the story. Uh, for me, it's about the story and the characters. Uh, I don't even need my characters to have an arc. Um, not, not to say they don't go through a transformation, but they don't have to come out a better person. Do you have any um, recommendations or tips of the trade for future screenwriters and potentially future submitters to this festival in terms of uh, uh, um, what, you, you, what you as a jury member would, are looking for? If you are passionate about your story and want to tell that story, just do it, just write it. Um, you can recraft it, but it's like, I, if you're writing to, I think I can feel when people are writing to just write something, which I think is great because you need to keep writing to keep writing, but um, there's just some magic in scripts, even if they're flawed, when somebody is truly understanding of the story and the characters, and it just resonates. So I think for me, it's, it's understanding what, what you're writing for, in terms of, am I writing a feature? So this is the structure I need. Am I writing a short? You know, so that kind of understanding of the medium, but it really is that un unteachable passion and understanding of the character and the story that pushes it, that little extra. Well, thank you very much, Patty. Um, I think we'll leave it at that. So thank you for your time and thank you so much for being involved in the, the festival and being on the jury. And uh, I hope you're able to uh, join us next weekend. Yes, uh, I'm excited. Perfect, that's great. Um, so I'll leave it at that and uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity.